technologies, um, in particular, um, in carrier, particular grade, carrier grade, nah, dual stack nah, light, dual stack um, light various, um, other various other terms, terms being bandied around. around. Um, I think it's um, quite a useful and interesting topic. Um, so John Mark's been good enough to come and, and share that with us. So I will um, hand you over to him. Now, you need to stand here so that you show up in the webcast. Thank you very much, Keith. It's a real pleasure to be here and, and share with you some, some thought about IPv6 transition. It's a huge topic and we could easily spend uh, a day talking about it. So my goal here today will be to share with you what are the main discussions happening with service providers uh, in the last 12 months because uh, we are seeing uh, really a second wave of IPv6 uh, interest. Uh, the first wave was um, probably seven, eight years ago, essentially pushed by uh, research education uh, customers who were implementing IPv6. But now uh, we are uh, seeing some real interest coming from the service provider space. And I'm going to talk about um, um, planning transition and then we'll really focus on the uh, solution and technologies being envisaged by these uh, customers. Uh, the driver is essentially the IPv4 depletion, which is predicted coming uh, in uh, mid-2011. So this date is moving over every day, and you can see some real-time statistic on the web on that. Uh, but that's interesting because seven, uh, eight years ago, it was more a chicken-egg problem, waiting for the application to run IPv6. And today it's much more carrot and stick situation. Uh, if we don't do anything, we are going to face big issues. And if we look at the service provider segment, it's essentially in the residential business where we, have, uh, we are seeing interest in moving to IPv6. Why? Because for each home, a uh, service provider typically use a, a single IPv4 public address. And uh, there are many IPv4 addresses used for this business. And as you know, uh, the revenue per user is, um, is not uh, uh, very, very huge. So they are looking at some ways of sparing IPv4 address for this residential business and maybe use this IPv4 public address for other business such as business services which are, uh, are more profitable. Um, in the business services, we need less IPv4 public addresses so there is less, uh, I would say, traction. Uh, because most uh, enterprises use VPN techniques with private address and, and very few IPv4 public address uh, natted. In the mobile, there is a huge potential given the number of devices we expect. However, in the mobile sector, they are still almost more in the transition of moving to packet-based networks. Uh, internet uh, is uh, still a very simple architecture. Uh, most of the traffic is centralized into service complex and the main problem in mobile space is actually about offloading service complex to uh, send uh, internet packet directly to, to the internet. So uh, this is going to come, but really most of, uh, of the interest uh, and traction is in the residential business today. Um, <clears throat> So there are basically three methodology to implement IPv6. The first one is core to edge, which, which is a simple one because in the core you are not facing any customers and not facing real traffic. So it's a good way to learn about IPv6. And most of our customers, although they spend uh, weeks or months actually in preparing this kind of uh, transition, the actual migration took or implementation of IPv6 took a few hours uh, uh, to be implemented in the wool backbone. It's a good way to learn for a holistic IPv6 approach. 
The other approach is edge to core, <coughs> which is the one that which is actually interesting if you want to benefit from IPv6 by delivering IPv6 service to your customers. So this is the one that is the most interesting today because this is a way of, uh, um, of um, uh, try starting to replace IPv4 allocation with IPv6 allocation and so start to spare IPv4 address. And the third approach is very tactical. It's connecting IPv6 Icelands which is a methodology being used by service providers when you want to sell some services to enterprise and if this enterprise asks for IPv6 as a mandatory requirement, such as in government, some, some government organizations. In that case, they find some very tactical ways of connecting these islands together without changing much uh, in, the, in, the, in the service provider network. So, um, there are many techniques uh, in order to do this transition, uh, starting from dual stack approach, uh, then we have uh, many tunneling techniques, either manual techniques or automatic uh, techniques or semi-automatic techniques, and we have translation techniques. All these techniques that are listed here, except the last line, have some uh, commercial vendor implementation. So they are all valid in some way, and they are all solving one problem. Uh, as you can see, the toolkit is very rich, maybe too rich, and we are not going to spend time, uh, I will s save your energy and time today, uh, not browsing all this technique uh, in details. We are going to focus on the one that are the most uh, um, envisaged uh, for coming months in service providers. One thing I want to say here is, about, is a word about translation. Uh, translation be between V4 and V6 is possible with NAT, NAT PT, which, was, uh, uh, which is an RFC uh, since a long time. Uh, and is necessary because V4 and V6 are not interoperable. However, the NAT PT as it was uh, uh, standardized is a very complex, uh, uh, well, NAT is complex by definition, but uh, it, it really breaks the end-to-end -end paradigm and uh, uh, there are many problems related to NAT PT, related to uh, sometimes the performance, the fact that it's not transparent application, the fact that you need to capture all DNS requests, the fact you, you have one single box, so it's not really reliable. It's uh, also sensitive to security. So for all these reasons, uh, IETF has decided to put this RFC as an historical status. So today there is a status quo about translation. translation. There are ongoing work going on in the IETF in a working groups such as Behave Group. So something will come out of, of this, but it's not mature anymore. Although there are some vendors implementation of the uh, uh, old uh, NetPT, which can be used in a tactical way. So translation is not much the hot topic today. We are more talking about dual stack. That's an important point. Uh, planning uh, IPv6 is uh, very important because IPv6 has some specific uh, techniques and there is a relative lack of experience uh, in the industry about IPv6 uh, in the service providers. Uh, so, as soon as, I mean, uh, always when you introduce a new technology, there are risks as, uh, associated to it. So, really, a careful planning is required. And more time you have, better you will do it and at a much cheaper cost. And as IPv6 is not much motivated by a strong business case, it's very important to plan in advance in order to avoid and limit costs in the network. For example, uh, if you uh, start soon to plan, you will benefit from your regular. Uh, recycling, recycle uh, uh, process of equipment to make sure that the new equipment will be compliant to the IPv6 according to the methodology you have decided. So uh, planning is very important. There are many steps uh, or many things uh, to, to be done. Um, uh, um, and it really requires a specific project within any organization in order to move to IPv6. Regarding the protocols, as I told before, they are not interoperable. Uh, as you can see and compare the, the headers, they are not the same. Uh, the address space is, of course, uh, much bigger in the IPv6 because this is the, the main goal of IPv6. Some headers uh, can be uh, um, found in the, in the IPv6 header as well. Some have moved to other places, but basically it's not the same protocol. So we can compare these two protocols as two different trains. And the problem we have is we have to run these two trains on the same tracks. So we have to, to find some way of coexist, of, uh, of coexistence. And we have also to move Voyager from one train to another train in the different train stations. So we have to find some way of doing the, 
the, the translation in uh, if someday we are in a situation where only IPv6 nodes will have to speak to only IPv4 nodes. Um, however, uh, what's going on in service provider today? And as I said, it's essentially in the residential business. The, the big issue is that when IPv6 was uh, designed and standardized in the ITF, what they have in, in mind was a long-term migration. So we were talking about a decade to move from V4 to V6. So we could start very slowly by implementing IPv6 in a dual stack mode. Uh, of course, with dual stack, you need as much IPv6 address as IPv4 address, or it doesn't solve the IPv4 depletion. But we didn't have this problem at that time. So we could start this way and then disconnect IPv4 from some nodes and, and progressively uh, move to a pure IPv6 internet. However, because of this picture you can see here, um, uh, we are forced to move to a cycle which is much shorter and we are talking about two, three years to uh, uh, do this tr transition. Um, however, it's clear that IPv4 will remain for a long term. And now we come to something which is the irony of IPv6, because irony, uh, IPv6 was supposed to bring back this end-to-end -end paradigm so that we could have no NAT from end-to-end, -end, so moving from internet to internet, as some are saying. However, uh, it seems clear today that we are going to use NAT and probably even more than before. Because if you take the situation of a service provider today, pure IPv4, they have IPv4 depletion uh, issue. They cannot distribute much more IPv4 address to their customer. So one solution is to uh, increase the NAT by using double NAT techniques. So in addition to the NAT in the CPE that we use today in the residential business, they will have a NAT somewhere in the network in order to share an IPv4 public address for many customers. So we do double NAT, but you can imagine the impact on the application. Um, uh, or they decide to move to IPv6 so that they start to distribute to the home not an IPv4 public address but only an IPv4 v6 public address. Uh, however, uh, as I said before, because of these translation issues which is not stabilized with NatPT which is now uh, depre being deprecated, they still ha need to have dual stack in the home. So the user will use both v4 and v6. So you still need to to, to do some NAT for the V4. V6 will be end-to-end -end with public address, but V4 will be NATed somewhere. And as it cannot be NATed anymore in the CPE because of, uh, 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 of lack of IPv4 address in the CPE, uh, it has to be done somewhere in the service provider network. So NAT will be used more and more, and it has to scale more, because as soon as you remove NAT from the CPE inside the service provider, you need to scale in terms of sessions. So that's why we talk about carrier-grade NAT or large-scale NAT a lot. So let's have a look to this technology a bit more in details. Uh, we start with dual stack as an assumption because this is the main uh, approach now being considered uh, by a service provider. So I'm talking about what's going on now. And in that scenario, all the hosts have both v4 and v6 address. And also all the devices in the chain are dual stacks so, or uh, routers typically we run both v4 and v6 address on each link and then it's up to the host to decide what to do it requests uh, to the dns a resolution for a server if he gets a v4 address he will use ipv4 stack if he gets an ipv6 address he will use ipv6 stack if it gets both then he has to choose um, that's a very uh, nice approach because it's really straightforward easy uh, it's a very simple implementation. You don't need any uh, fancy technology. However, uh, dual stack is not envisageable end-to-end -end because in that case you are not sparing any IPv4 address because you need as much V4 as V6 addresses, right? And also there are probably some potential uh, uh, issues or challenge on the host side if it gets two different address, how is going the application uh, to handle this? Fortunately for us, as Juniper, we are not much in the uh, computer and, and uh, software uh, uh, application side, so um, we can focus on the infrastructure, but it probably would be interesting to, to spend some time on this, uh, on this aspect as well. So in the infrastructure, we have the core and the access. 
I will start with the core, which is a very mature, uh, I would say, situation, because we, uh, there are a lot of experience already in the field. You have basically two approach. Either you run IPv6 natively, or you use MPLS. If today you run IPv4 native in your core, probably the best way, uh, best approach is to use IPv6 native. So you run dual stack everywhere, and you use OSPIv3 or ISAS protocol to exchange IPv6 address, and of course BGP at the borders. However, if you have uh, some core router that do not support IPv6 uh, well, or do not support the performance, you can use some tunneling techniques in order to connect the PEs with some IPv4 tunnels, and you encapsulate IPv6. But in both cases, you are running uh, native um, uh, IPv6 and IPv4 um, in, in dual stack, at least at the edge. Uh, the other approach is MPLS, which is actually very popular because MPLS is already there in the service provider networks. So why not using the same MPLS stack to, to transport both V4 and V6? And there are two major, uh, two main uh, techniques here. Either you use 6PE or uh, layer 3 VPN. To be exhaustive, I should also mention some layer 2 VPN techniques, which could also be used to carry IPv6 packet transparently. If you want to connect enterprise, for example, uh, and deliver IPv6 without having any IPv6 in your network, you could use layer 2 VPN as well. But let's have a look uh, to this, the main two uh, techniques being used, which are 6PE and layer 3 VPN. The 6PE, uh, and both are standardized as RFCs, uh, is actually uh, so an RFC called IPv6 Iceland over I MPLS IPv4 core. And IPv6 VPN is a technique that is very similar to uh, IPv4 layer 3 VPN. Important is that both techniques do not require to have any IPv6 in the core. So MPLS, which is the foundation in the network, is actually based on IPv4 control plane. So you don't need to implement IPv6 at all in the core. With the 6P, um, and actually both are very mature. Uh, they are deployment since uh, several years. Uh, so it's really something that uh, can be implemented by service provider with a very, very limited risk today. The difference between the two is that with 6PE, all the IPv6 uh, routing uh, are uh, in the same instance as the IPv4 address. So it's in the main routing uh, table. So it's a technique that is uh, very suitable for uh, internet IPv6, which will, be, uh, we, which will share the same uh, uh, routing uh, tables as IPv4. With IPv6 VPN, it's VRF. So uh, that support the IPv6 route. You have a strict isolation, so you can support IPv6 private address. You can overlap address because uh, they will be isolated in each VRF. So it's really a VPN techniques. And by the way, you can use a VPN to carry internet IPv6 as well, as we do or sometimes with IPv4. So the infrastructure for 6PE uh, looks uh, like this. You have uh, here the core in gray which is using an IPv4 control plane, using LDP or RSVP uh, to connect the different uh, routers and the different PE routers. The PE routers use BGP to exchange IPv4 address, but also IPv6 address, uh, possibly via root reflectors. And the customers you see here in blue are running IPv6. They are connected with a routing protocol, which could be uh, BGP, or uh, any other uh, routing protocol such as OSPF or SAS or even, even RIPNG. Um, and uh, BGP will exchange all this V6 address, but in the core, at data plane, all the V6 packets are encapsulated in an MPLS packet based on an IPv4 control plane. Something which is different from IPv4 transport <coughs> is um, uh, when, when you transport an IPv4 packet, we just put the IPv4 packet in an MPLS so with one label, and uh, we can use the penultimate hop popping, which uh, remove the label at the last P router before going to the egress PE, right? Um, it will not work well with IPv6, because if we do so, 
then the IPv6 packet will be exposed to the PE, the last PE in the chain, before reaching the egress PE. And this P router may not support IPv6 because the core is supposed to be agnostic to IPv6. So in order to avoid that, we use a label which we uh, are stacking. And so the scheme is slightly different from V4 to V6. With V6, we are adding one specific inner label, actually similarly to a VPN, which is going to be used for the last hop so that the uh, P2 uh, in this picture is going to receive the IPv6 packets still encapsulated in MPLS. And this label Y you see in this picture is exchanged with BGP. With layer free VPN, which is another technique, and again the difference is that the routing, uh, uh, the IPv6 address will be in some dedicated VRS, so we are uh, isolating the addresses. The technique is exactly the same as IPv4 uh, VPN. So we use a root distinguisher to deambiguate the routes. We use uh, also an extended community root target in order to manage the import and export uh, uh, to manage the VRFs exchange. We use BGP to exchange all these routes. And the PE router will push two, uh, two label. Uh, one label is an inner label used to identify the VPN and the related VRF at the other end of the network. And the other label is the outer label being used uh, for at the data plane to uh, forward the packets to the egress PE. So the picture looks exactly like an IPv4 or la uh, layer free VPN. And actually, uh, I have to mention here that in theory, we could use IPv6 as a control plane in the core as well. Uh, that, that in theory should work. However, there is no much demand on that side. There are no real deployments or implementation because the customers are not seeing any benefits of using IPv6 in the core. Uh, as they have anyway IPv4 today, they have the expertise and they are not going to suffer from using IPv4 address in the core. So let's keep IPv4 in the core as the control plane, and uh, there is no much uh, push uh, of moving this to IPv6. Let's have a look now to the access, where I think they are uh, the most newer things. And uh, we had uh, a lot of uh, activity uh, in the ITF in the, last, in the last 12 months. In the access, <coughs> This is where the main, most of the challenge and actually the benefit is in uh, moving from uh, current architecture to something new. Because in the residential business, which is again here the main motivation, you typically uh, provide an IPv4 public address to the uh, CPE or the set-top box or the router gateway. And this IPv4 public address is being used for one single home. And the reason we use NAT at this uh, place is because it's very easy. It doesn't require to scale much. All the CPE uh, can do NAT. I mean, it's, it's a model that works very well. But if we want to start to spare IPv4 address, we need to find a solution here. We need to use uh, one single IPv4 public address for multiple homes. So the question or the solution is uh, necessarily about moving or duplicating the NAT functionality somewhere else in the network. Uh, so again, here the motivation for IPv6 will not be IPv6 itself. It's going to be about solving a problem related to IPv4. There are uh, three main uh, uh, techniques being discussed. The first one, which is getting some traction, uh, in particular in Asia, is NAT444, which is very simple and straightforward for very quick de deployment. It's about adding a NAT somewhere in the service provider network. So we keep the NAT in the CPE, in the home. We translate the private address of the customer into a private address of the service provider. And somewhere in the core or in the, in the edge, there is a NAT performed by the uh, service provider to translate the service provider private IPv4 address into uh, an IPv4 uh, public address, so double NAT. 
And that's um, uh, easy to implement in the sense that uh, the CPE doesn't have to change, so you can implement the solution within the existing network very easily. However, you are complexifying or making more complex uh, the end-to-end -end paradigm because now you have two NAT. And if you deliver some uh, services to your customers, uh, you may have more and more, more issues coming, uh, in particular for applications such as voice over IP or video, a double NAT is not really not friendly. Um, also, you are starting to introduce NAT in the service provider network, so you have to consider the scaling aspect. How many sessions are you going to be able to sustain in your network uh, as you will uh, concentrate many uh, users in one single box? Um, again, here, this is a pure v4 problem and a pure v4 solution. If you run IPv6, you deploy IPv6 in parallel, and you have an end-to-end -end paradigm without any NAT, right? The other approach is called DS Lite. And DS Lite is a solution that is uh, solving the IPv4 depletion because we move the NAT from the CPE to the service provider, but it's also uh, trying to keep uh, the situation we have today, which is one single NAT from end to end. So we remove completely the NAT function of the CPE. Uh, if we do so, uh, and if we want to have the NAT done in the service provider with one single uh, public V4 address for multiple homes, we need to encapsulate the packet from the CPE to the uh, NAT box in the service provider. And we could use any techniques to encapsulate that IPv4 packet. However, there is now an opportunity to use IPv6 for that. So you implement IPv6 up to the access, so up to the CPE. The CPE is dual stack. For the V6, you have end-to-end. -end. And for the V4, you take the private IPv4 packet from the home, you encapsulate it into an IPv6 Packet, so you create a soft wire, which terminates into the NAT box of the service provider, where you decapsulate the IPv6 packet, you retrieve the IPv4 private packet of the, of the user, and you do the NAT by using one single IPv4 public address for multiple customers. So that's uh, the DS Lite approach, which um, um, reduces the complexity because you, we keep only one single NAT, uh, however, we still have the scalability uh, aspect to consider because the NAT is being done somewhere in the service provider network. And in the CPE, it now requires some change because the CPE has to be dual stack, uh, dual stack light. Uh, uh, it has to encapsulate IPv4 to IPv6. So some change has to be done in the CPE uh, in order to do that. However, it's a not a a very complex task because the CPE only has to encapsulate into IPv6. So it's a relatively uh, easy uh, implementation uh, as far as CPE is concerned. The third one uh, approach, which is, uh, and actually this one, uh, the second one, uh, I have to mention here that this is the main uh, interest we are getting from customer because it solves IPv4 depletion. Uh, while introducing IPv6 up to the, up to the access uh, and while keeping uh, the same end-to-end uh, -end paradigm with one single NAT. So this is really a solution that is being uh, considered seriously by several customers in order to face this IPv4 depletion. The third one is more advanced, a bit more complex. It's about solving one of the problem of the previous solution, which is um, uh, the scalability of the of the of the of the NAT, uh, because uh, the, the the problem, as you have seen, is that NAT has to be done somewhere in the in the in the core or in the edge, and it has to scale. So here, the proposal is to have um, a protocol being established between the service provider box and the CPE, so that NAT is going to be done inside the CPE. So we bring back the single NAT into the CPE for scalability, but it's, uh, it, it does not dictate by rules given by the core box. In other words, the core box will communicate the prefix 
IPv4 public address that has to be used by the CPE. I will communicate also the port range and limited port range that can be used so that that IPv4 public address can be shared by many homes. So we bring back the NAT uh, and uh, into the CPE. So the CPE has to do the, the, the NAT v4 to v4. Uh, but um, it has to be more sophisticated because it requires a control plane, so a control uh, uh, management protocol to be established between the CPE and the service provider box. So this, from technology point of view, First, it's not mature, and it has to be uh, developed and implemented. So that's probably something more for the future. And actually, we may not see so much interest if we can achieve scalability uh, with NAT in the core, which is also a possibility. Um, to illustrate a bit the scalability issue, uh, let me show you a picture. Uh, if you take your PC here and you limit the number of sessions to 10, session simultaneously and you try to uh, just look some f map somewhere with Google map uh, you will see that uh, even if you use only this application you will have difficulties to know where you are actually we are using a lot of TCP uh, of sessions sim simultaneously and just by using a normal application you can easily use hundreds of uh, simultaneous uh, session with your single PC. So that gives you an idea about what we are looking for as a scalable NAT solution if it has to be done out from the CPE but somewhere in the service provider. Um, however, with the ASIC technology uh, they are and, 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 and new CPE um, uh, processor, there are some uh, uh, promising and, 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 and some good scale numbers that are achieved today. But this is something to consider if you design your network, is how much do I need to scale and what kind of NAT box do I need to install in the network. So fortunately for you, uh, we are running out of time, so I cannot use my uh, uh, marketing slide. I have to put uh, everywhere when I talk. Um, but um, uh, obviously, um, I'm, if you allow me, I have to tell you that we have a lot of experience in V6, both in routing in the core, in the edge, but also in the security area and translation. So this is a topic we are uh, more than happy to uh, discuss with you. In conclusion, I want to say that definitely IPv6 is being considered by our customers as inevitable. I, IPv6 is not being introduced because of a specific business case, but as an opportunity while solving the IPv4 depletion, which is not predicted in the very short term. So it's happening worldwide. Um, all is about planning uh, because as business is not much behind, it's all about reducing cost of introducing IPv6. And uh, we will be, of course, more than happy to share our experience with you if you want to engage in some discussion. Thank you very much. There is one question. I will repeat the question then. Hello. Ah, it works. Good. Um, uh, Adrian from Andrews Nonald. Uh, one of the, the issues we have with IP6 deployment is we've got a lot of customers who'd like to use IP6, but the cheap CPE, uh, things like Zaxel routers, um, we have enough trouble getting them to, to do an IP4 stack sensibly on that. Um, what we'd really like is to see CPE that just works with IP6 so that our customers can actually use IP6 in their homes, in their offices in the first place with, without hassle or having to go by a Cisco router. Um, I'm sure you'd agree. <laughs> and um, can you see any way we can encourage CPE manufacturers to actually start doing software releases with proper IP6 support in their low-end CPE? So you mean IPv6 only or dual stack uh, or well, whatever? It, it obviously, it needs to support IP4 in some way, almost certainly. Um, but the, the, the problem is people who want to use IP6 find it difficult and expensive to do so, hmm. even if their ISP like us supports that. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think uh, probably on this side, 
uh, as close as we are to the user, so in the CPE, close we are to the application. And there is no IPv6 application, or there are some artificial application, but there are not much IPv6 uh, specific application. So probably uh, 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 these guys are, are, are following the, or followed so far the, uh, the pressure from the, the business case related to application, which is not bringing us much today. Um, I think now they are getting a new uh, type of pressure coming from service provider implementing V6 into the CPE, uh, not because of uh, the application, but because of this IPv4 depletion. And the customer we are talking to, uh, many are just planning today and they are doing some trials. Some have deployed IPv6 in production and they have find some way of, of implementing IPv6. In France, you can get uh, V6, for example, at your home. Uh, so some provider have found some solution. Uh, there are also some new generation set up box that are being planned, which will uh, support a dual stack. So I think uh, this is coming. This is the, uh, you know, the, all the discussion uh, related to what I talk about today are very recent. Off of IPv6 is a long debate since many years. Really, what's being discussed now with GS Lite, et cetera, is one year old. So I think we are going to see some, some changes happening in the CP side as well. Just a guess, of course. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. So it's probably not your area, uh, Jean-Marc, but, but one, one of the challenges we're finding um, in deploying IPv6 isn't actually the routing element. That actually works pretty well. It's things like firewalls, um, all, all the kind of bits of network architecture that goes around it. I know you guys are, you know, with, with your acquisition of NetScreen a few years ago. How, how are you progressing IPv6 into that um, arena? So, um, yeah, I, I think the, what the customer are asking us when they want, when they talk about IPv6 is uh, in terms of security, they want to have the same level of security with IPv6 as with IPv4, at least. So that that means from our side, from technology point of view, when we develop uh, uh, firewall capabilities, we are trying to have one-to-one uh, -one mapping between the uh, functionality of v4 and v6. So that's that's the. Uh, it's it's trying to do the same, right? That's 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 the the goal we are we are trying to achieve. Um, I would say that one big complexity was about translation, because most of the customers a few years ago were saying, "I'm going to deploy IPv6, but my IPv6 not need to talk to IPv4," and so with translation, it adds a lot of additional pain and even more than than just firewall. Uh, this is being. Um, not solved, but this is progressing by the fact that now we are talking about using le less uh, uh, translation, promoting dual stack, uh, and this is what we can see with the deprecation of, um, of NetPT. And the new NAT uh, or translation technique being discussed at the ETF, which will be much simpler, uh, having less responsibility into the NAT box, having more the responsibility inside the application to handle this translation. So. In other words, limiting ALG uh, requirements in this box. So it's, the trend is about simplifying, if, if I can use that example, it's about simplifying what would be between the two hosts. Olivier crepin uh, ISOC England, and uh, Uralo, uh, ICANN, Z large. Um, do you think that NAT uh, or the techniques that you uh, you described earlier will speed up IPv6 adoption or slow it down uh, by just making it less painful? Uh, I think it will accelerate IPv6 deployment because uh, it's, it's your question, right? If it's going to. Okay. Yeah. Um, because actually, uh, the GS Lite, which is the most popular one being discussed today with service provider, as you can see, it's not about uh, driving V6 deployment for, for V6 reason. It's about solving the V4 problem, but using the V4 issue uh, um, as a, uh, or the, the solution to solve the IPv4 issue 
allows at the same time to introduce IPv6. So we use IPv6 just as a tunneling technique in the access. But we could use anything else. We could use uh, MPLS LSP, we could use uh, a PPP, anything that can carry the IPv4 packet to some centralized NAT, right? But service provider think, okay, as I have to do something, let's use IPv6 as a tunneling technique. So I push IPv6 and I prepare the next step, which will be someday necessarily IPv6. So, so I think it's accelerating the IPv6 development because now we don't need we don't need to wait the business case of IPv6 application. But, but some in in, uh, in the US are advocating the use of multiple NATs. Um, is this something which you see as a solution? So that's the 444 approach, right? Correct. And which yeah. is also uh, we have also customers in Asia interested in this. So in, in in that case, they say, okay, I don't want to. I want to do something very fast. So the motivation is here when they, they are lacking IPv4 address, so they need to do something immediately. The advantage of this, you don't need to touch the CPE. So you can immediately put a NAT somewhere in the network, and you add the second layer of NAT in addition to the one you do in the CPE. So it's purely tactical to be fast. But you don't introduce anything related to IPv6 in that case. So you need to start to plan and prepare a next step. How much will the total cost of this uh, transition phase? I think it's an advantage to be faster, but probably it's going to add uh, some effort as the aim goal is anyway to go for IPv6. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, thanks very much, Ron Mark. Um, just a reminder, when you're asking questions, remember there's a webcast out there. Please identify yourself before asking the question. Um, okay, our next speaker is Neil Long from, from Team Coomery. Um I've heard quite a lot of Team Coomery presentations in various other forums. Um, they're doing some really interesting security work. Um, and they have some guys in the UK, um, of which Neil is one. So I thought it'd be interesting um, to have Neil come along and, and give an update about what they're doing. So over to Neil. Right, you need to stand between the lines again. Thank you. Just reach out. Hello. Um, I know quite a lot of you over the time, but uh, is this on? You're OK? So um, we worked, started off mainly working with the, um, very tightly with the NSP, the NSP SEC type community over the years. And we still do that. Um, I used to be on NSP SEC and now I migrated out. But one of the things that we're trying to do is to sort of uh, reach out wider and further, especially in